you cannot also be coaching at the same time. Like or the that over cheerleader is yeah. Or standing on the sideline being like, great job. You made it over that. Great job. You're doing that. Great job. Like just sh- <laughs> what was that? shut the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Shankcast episode 13. Fun fact, 13 is my lucky number. Is it really? It's my favorite, yeah. Isn't there a lot of hotels that don't have yeah. that? Yeah. That's why that's I like it, because it's like the weird number that everybody thinks yeah. is like bad luck or whatever. I believe that. So I like being, okay. I like being number 13. She's like, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> bothers Megan instantly. Yep. Like she yep. doesn't even know I why, know. but it, it, she's upset. <laughs> Not upset. I say, and I get it. I get it. I understand because you like to like push yeah. the boundaries. Okay. Anyways, do, yeah. episode yeah, number right. thirteen. So today we're going to be talking about tennis. The title of today's episode: Tennis Parenting Crash Course. Mm. We're going to talk about being a tennis parent and the questions that we have on the list. Not sure whether or not we'll get to all of them or not. Uh, we've already we've been talking in the last couple of minutes. More than likely, we'll do multiple episodes on tennis parenting because we we have a lot to say about it. <laughs> and frankly, there's a lot parents should should know about and should be aware of and have information on because there's a lot of like it can go bad <laughs> yeah, really yeah. quick. I, I wanted to start with a positive in that statement. Oh, sorry. There's it yeah, can it could be wonderful really quick right. too. You There's can, a lot yeah. of ways to be successful, but also a lot of ways to mess it all up. And so we're going to try to cover some Hence of those parenting. today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Parent, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's parenting, but with tennis. <laughs> There's a million Devil. and one ways to do it right and a million and one ways to, to uh, make sure your kid has to go to therapy. So uh, the questions we have on our list today, what are the upsides of being involved with your kid's tennis? And we're going to talk about, it's not like binary, like you're either involved or not involved, but we're going to talk about different degrees to which parents get involved and what the pros and cons are of that. And that's the other uh, question we're going to answer. What are the dangers of being involved with your kid's tennis? Will you or would you coach your own kids? All three of us have children, so we're going to answer that (laughs) and why or why not. What would you look for in a coach for your kids if you're not going to coach your own kids? And then uh, also managing a coach and child uh, relationship. How do you act as that kind of go-between in that, in that um, partnership? And finally, how do you switch coaches for your kid when it's, if you feel like it's time to move on? It's not you. Well, that's a sticky, <laughs> that's a sticky uh, questions here. So first, to kick things off, we're going to go around the table and 60 seconds or less what is your experience with parents and kids and tennis <laughs> professionally? Like just to give the audience like some, some perspective here. Uh, Kevin, why don't you start? Oh, wow. Uh, 60 seconds or less. Yes. Well, worked at a tennis academy with dealing with parents and kids and junior development pretty much my entire career. Um, worked there for what, 14 years was it? Yeah. So as far as like, that was probably my primary role as being the coach, therapist, um, <laughs> relationship manager, um, jack of all trades, dealing with parents, dealing with the motions of kids um, at every level. So meaning that from, I think, what was your youngest kids? Probably like three, three. Yeah. To up to like going to college and that whole process. The cool thing, I think, in our situation Uh, is that we got to see the entire process. Some coaches just kind of start them off and they hand them over. And we did that too. Uh, But there was a lot of long-term relationship building. Megan. Um, So, yeah, mine's probably about the same. (laughs) Um, But, uh, yeah, I worked with a lot of high-level juniors as well as beginners Um, as well as little tiny kiddos and um, did a ton of education classes for parents actually organized a lot of parent meetings um, at for every different level and um, held our kids accountable to USDA and make sure that they made all the guidelines so that they can make all the tournaments and so yada 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 Um, so yeah I think education of parents is really key and um 
understanding the parents' role, the coach's role, and the player's role was probably one of my biggest things that I advocated for the 14 years that we were at the academy, for sure. Awesome. Uh, so my background is super different. I have no high performance experience at all. Uh, I was very much kind of grassroots country club and commercial club and did the whole range of ages from the peewee. When you're the new, you know, coach at the club. Always get the peewees. You're, do you're doing Always. the peewees. Yep. Oh, yeah. So I did a couple years of the, of the peewees. Definitely not my that's like <laughs> i would eight pay hours of private lessons I like that's what it takes yeah, out of me no. to do the to do the for peewees. everyone it's the hardest it, class it ever it is hard yeah it's super difficult so i did that all the way up through high school uh age and we had you know we had some stronger players but nobody ranked nationally uh maybe a couple players ranked uh, regionally uh or at the state level um uh, but i've seen my like lens that i'm looking through is kind of in a family club uh environment strictly and not the whole high performance um you know kind of side of things mm -hmm. so question number one and you want to start here kevin sure what are the upsides what are the potential upsides of parent being and let's kind of define like the way i wrote the questions initially but as i spoke them i realized there needs there's a lot of nuance in there um let's talk about like what are the different degrees that parent child or, I'm sorry, that a parent can be involved in their child's tennis. Can or should? Can. can. Like, okay. what, what is, like, one, what are the two, like, extremes? And then we'll get into more of our okay. opinion okay. And, like, and, like, the should. Uh, so what are, what, are, what are the far extremes that you guys saw in a high-performance uh, environment? I think um, starting from, let's start from not involved to involved. So uh, I had a bunch of parents that knew very little about tennis, um, and, you know, that works. Um, even at a high level, you know, we had some parents that, you know, we might have a dad or I used to love it. Uh, he would tell us, go drive his son to a tournament and like, just tell the son, like, make sure you bring your wheels, son. And I mean, cause he just <laughs> didn't know much. And, and that really worked out well in the sense that, you know, the kid didn't feel a lot of pressure. Um, and I think he it's just, dad phrase. yeah, he just really enjoyed being a part of his son's process. It wasn't about necessarily his son becoming a champion or something or a world beater is just like, I just love watching my son go out and play. I think the next degree would be maybe a parent that plays tennis, but they're not really the coach. Um, again, you, I guess I'll go through the degrees. I won't talk about like the pluses or negatives, but I think in all cases, there's just a, a positive sense of like, you can relate to your child maybe a little bit more. You um, have some experience. You might hopefully be able to relate to what they're going through on the court because you understand it yourself. Um, I think the next level from someone who plays tennis is someone who maybe um, has played a high degree of tennis. So the first stage is like, oh, I'm a, you know, I hit a little bit too like and I play three, three, five. three, five. And then you have the parent who's played like college, college tennis, tennis uh, maybe even sometimes professional tennis that really, and they understand, okay, like I want you, they sometimes have this like, uh, okay, you can achieve this and be a, a national ranked kid. Follow in my footsteps. Yeah, follow my footsteps or something oh, like oh, that. Boy. Um I think the next degree is you have a parent who's the, who is a, uh, a, a coach. coach. Yeah. And so they themselves coach and sometimes they have other people coach their kid or sometimes you, there's a tendency sometimes to coach a little bit in the beginning and then hand it off to another coach. Um, there's a whole range of experience levels there too, right? Yeah. There's a Where huge range. Parent of, didn't play any tennis at all, or maybe they were okay, or maybe right, they, and they read in a book level. or whatever, yeah, yeah, how to, yeah. how to so teach tennis. You, there's a lot of different, but I would say those was that four major categories, not playing tennis, kind of like tinker around with tennis, three, five, playing a high degree of tennis, then coaching tennis. What do you think? Did I miss one? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's pretty much all the levels so. all right so what are the upsides of being involved then and to and to different degrees so we just defined like a couple different uh, uh quantities or that a, a parent can be involved in the whole coaching uh process what are the positives that could come away from from maybe each of those uh different degrees yeah i think it's important to realize that there can be a positive no matter what the experience level is and i think sometimes that 
is taken like out of context. Like people are like, Oh, well you're a coach, you know, a lot, so you're either <laughs> really good or a really bad parent. You know what I mean? So it all kind of, you can be a really good, in my opinion, um, parent and be a high level tennis player. You can be, um, low level tennis player, any level. And I think a lot of it comes from the communication with the coach because each coach has different parent expectations. Um, my parent expectations might be different than Kevin's, might be different than yours, just depending upon how you coach and what your hands on and how much you can handle the parents being hands on as well. Parent personality. Um, yeah, for sure. Parent personality. I mean, I think so if you go through like, okay, I don't know anything about tennis and the parent is, um, I think one of the biggest things in all the levels is that I used to always say the parent is your biggest cheerleader and should be your biggest cheerleader so that the coach can coach. And that role I feel like needs to be established very, very early um, because if the parent is also trying to coach, then the coach has to become a cheerleader because someone has to be in the player's background. They have to be pushing for the kiddo. And if no one is cheering them on, then they either have to be really self-motivated and cheer themselves on, which is really, really difficult for most children, or they end up just becoming very negative and having negative associations with tennis and the tennis court and lessons and academy and blah, blah, blah. So that was always my biggest, no matter what level you've played at tennis, whether you haven't ever picked up a racket in your life and haven't ever watched tennis on TV, nothing compared to you played on the pro tour for 10 years and got top hundred in the world. Like no matter what your goal as a parent is to be the cheerleader. And so that way the coach can be the coach. That was always my like go to start. There's a lot more on like things. Yeah, but. yeah. The cheerleaders, whatever, whatever you want. To, cheerleaders is a great way of describing it. I think. I think that's the biggest upside of a parent being involved, uh, for sure. Is just to have that emotional and like psychological support. Because tennis, tennis has a somewhat unique. There's other individual sports, obviously, but I think tennis has a somewhat unique way of exposing people and making them feel vulnerable on the court <laughs> and as a kid like having to go, come toe to toe with that as a child whether you're whatever five six seven ten twelve fourteen like whatever it is if you don't have somebody who's if you don't have another person to talk to who's uh, besides the person who's trying to push you and develop you and like make you stronger on the court, if you don't have somebody to like empathize with you, uh, Kevin, you're talking about how like it can be helpful if a parent has some tennis. If they're not involved at all, it's difficult for them to understand like what's going on out there. If you don't have somebody in that role, then uh, it's lonely out there and yeah. it can get like you're talking about the negative kind of spiral that can happen super, super easily for a kid. I mean, it happens easily for adults. Yeah. <laughs> I think Go kids ahead, need some support out there. I think also what's the interesting dynamic that I think spills over into tennis is the child parent relationship outside of tennis. So whatever relationship a lot of, I think parents and kids have outside of tennis tends to spill over into tennis. Meaning if they're maybe a go lucky parent, they generally sometimes translate, if they don't know a lot about tennis, to a go-lucky, like, oh, okay, you hit, oh, wow, you hit the ball over, that's awesome. And the kids' kind of expectations might be a little higher than the parent. And sometimes that works out well, I think, because the parent is not knowledgeable. And so their level of expectation of anything is just like, wow, he made contact. Or, and so the kid feels, in, depending on the personality, the kid feels like zero pressure. It's like, oh, dude, mom and dad have no clue what's going on over there. I'm free. And sometimes that relationship, if the parent does know some more about tennis, then the kid sometimes feels like there is an expectation because my dad or mom is such and such a level. And so it's really tricky. It's really interesting how it's so different with so many kids. Um, like we've had kids where the parent had these super high expectations 
And the kid was super savvy and they're like, whatever. And they just manage their parents. It's very, very yeah. rare. But it's the coolest thing to see where you, you see like the parent kind of going overboard. And the, the, like the kids, like the coach is like, yeah, don't worry about my mom or my dad. You know, I, I got them. Yeah, they and literally they, will <laughs> tell you that. Like, yeah, it's like, okay. We know they're uh, crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah. They understand. That, and, but that's so, so rare. On the flip side, it's like where the expectation spills over into like, I, I totally agree with what, what Megan's saying is that the parent doesn't understand or doesn't uh, ha has a hard time separating the cheerleader versus the pusher, uh, meaning the the like you should want to do this because and, and this is what you should and I think you know and we'll talk about it, at least I'll talk about it like let's yeah let's go ahead yeah. and make the pivot into yeah. like, can I say one more thing yeah, like sure. because I I definitely don't think and I think this is a big myth out there that. If you know l nothing about tennis, that your expectations are low, and so then your kid's going to be like, oh, that's great. And if you know a ton about tennis, your expectations totally are agree. super high, yeah. because it's definitely not the case. You could be a very, very high-level tennis player and have low expectations for your kid in the sense of like, do what you need to do, like, you know, and you could be the opposite. You could have zero knowledge yeah. and be like, well, you should be at this level at yeah. this time. I mean, I have dealt yeah. with all There's of that as well. That so, <laughs> yeah, I just want to make it very clear that yeah. it's not, it's expectations not are yeah. not tennis specific. Yeah, exactly. And so, I totally agree. Yeah. I think that's, that's important. A good point. So it's kind of flipping, you're kind of starting to go into more of like what to be careful for as parents. Like what, what are the pitfalls <laughs> or the, the dangers to being really involved oh, wow. in your, your kid's tennis I think the first danger is to, I think my number one danger is to, um, what's, how do I want to say it, is to imprint your wants or your lack of your tennis career or your your goals onto your child that's the f number one thing where like megan's saying and the, the flip side of it if you have no expectation you're like you see other people playing you're like well that child oh that ooh, oh a, a, okay my child should be and you you never connected with your kid and said what do you want to do with this tennis thing i think that's for me probably the number one thing is where the parents expectation from either the beginning, like Megan's talking about, or sometimes they don't have expectation wherever they are, that expectation becomes the goal for the kid through the parent. Instead of really, for me, in the beginning, it's about teaching the child to enjoy the game, to love playing the game for themselves. Because I think in the beginning, it's really easy to kind of like, you can push your kid and you can push your kid, and it's okay because especially when they're young, they kind of don't know. And they're like, okay, mommy and daddy, mommy and daddy, they want me to do this. But then as they get older and they start kind of like self-analyzing, it's like, okay, why am I out here? Uh, I don't listen to mommy and daddy all the time anymore. Why am I, this sucks. I don't, they've been pushing me to do this. And now I realize I don't want to do this. And then that flip, that switch happens. And then like 13, 14, 15, right around 16, it's like, it's the parents are like, why don't you want to do this? And, and it just turns into this war of you having to motivate your child versus you're not applying yourself. Yeah. You're not, you're being lazy. You're not extra hitting extra serves. And then you see where the kids that really tend to, I think, love the game, how, if you nurture that as they get older, there's like, Hey, I want to go do this. I want to go serve some more. I want to go do this. And the parents aren't necessarily pushing it. It can happen the flip side too. But I think when the kid really develops it, um, and the other side of it is I, I don't think the kids necessarily know. I've had parents who the kid did not want to play tennis. And this is the wildest thing. Did not want to play tennis early. And the mom was like, yeah, you're going you're gonna <laughs> to go, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then around 13, 14, he was like, yeah, you know what? I want to be really good. And the mom was always like pushing, pushing. And out, this of, kid, out of 100 kids, though, how many times have you seen a pusher parent like – have it's that, a, it's that a tricky one. Outcome. I'm just saying. Yeah, that he managed that he, situation. Yeah, and I was going to say he managed that situation, but you, it's just there's no, I would say, wrong or right way of when the kid's going to find motivation. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but I definitely feel like if you can have them cultivate that early. And he flipped, and he's a Division One really good player. And for some odd reason, his motivation kicked in later. And he was kind of like the driver of his motivation, even though he still had his mom kind of and parents like pushing, pushing, pushing. But he became the driver. And I think that's the key for me. When you can have your child become the driver of their motivation, it opens the door to 
having a successful, hopefully, relationship. And those drivers, those kids that become drivers, tend to manage their parents and their expectations better because it's like, this is my bus. I don't think... This is really tricky, by Yeah, because yeah. I don't think when they're little, they know, like, what they want to do, number one. So I think up until they really decide, like, hey, I want to play tennis, like, at a high level, until they actually say, like, that's my goal. Like, the whole goal should be to have fun. Have fun and, yeah. and, you know, you can go out and you can hit with your kid if you have the experience of playing. But I don't think it's... Um, about like, okay, when they're four years old, I'm going to make them into a high performance player. Like if you have that mindset as a parent, <laughs> you are going to struggle and your kid is going to struggle and your relationship is going to struggle. I think no matter what the goal is, is like, yes, the goal needs to come from the kid. But I think a lot of times the kid doesn't know what the goals, what they want their goals to be. And even, I mean, I can't tell you how many 16, 17 year olds that we've coached that don't even still don't know what their goals are. Their goals change or whatever. I guess, and so, sorry, when I say goals, just to be clear, I meant like the goal should be to have fun. I think first of all, and then that's the kid's goal going out to the court should just be like, hey, I just and and as far as like setting a goal for like high level, that's up to them later, or the parent. But just to be clear, when I say goal or having the goal should be like for me or for if, if I was a child, it's, it's not just like national top 20. No, no, no. no. <laughs> like when I say goal, it's like, hey, you want to go play tennis? And like, yeah, that's fun. That literally should be the goal for the kid to right. have fun. But what I'm getting at is like they don't necessarily even know. Like there's plenty I, of kids that I taught throughout the ages that they go through the up and downs too. And I can't tell you how many parents like good, good tennis parents, like we call them, um, where their kid goes through a few days where they're like, I don't want to play tennis. And the mom or dad is like, okay, what, you know, what do, what do I do? Like, do I just let them quit? And I'm like, no, there are certain times where you just go, hey, you know what? We committed to playing tennis for this amount of time. You're going to continue with that commitment. And then at the end of that, if you decide you want to quit tennis, 100% I'm all for it. But there's also the parent that's like, oh, you're in the driver's seat. You want to quit today? We're quitting today. Oh, you want to be top level 20 in the world tomorrow? Okay, we're going to do that tomorrow. And you can't be that parent yeah, either. Yeah, I agree with that. There's so there's that like... There, it's a obviously a gray area, but I think it's just having communication with your kid um, early and being like, obviously their biggest cheerleader, but also being like, okay, so we've committed to six weeks of tennis. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Okay, great. We're going to do six weeks of tennis. And then you, you actually do the six week of tennis. You don't say, oh, like when they're 11 or, or even like seven or eight, they sign up for six weeks of tennis. And I can't tell you how many parents are like, well, after the first week, they didn't want to come. So little Jimmy wanted to stay home. And then three weeks later, oh, he wants to come back. So we're going to come back for two weeks. And I think if you start that roller coaster early, it's hard to get them to commit um, one way or the other. Does that I don't make know. sense? I, I still think I, I totally agree with like finding some level of commitment. But I still think if they don't really want to be there, I've had kids where they've had that roller coaster, but at the end they're like, they just turned into like, hey, I just want to come out and hit balls. And so I guess it's like, yeah, you have that where sometimes they check in and check out or sometimes maybe the family's a little bit more committed. Um, but I still think in the end it's like, then go play another sport. I'm totally okay with like, if you're checking in, checking out, like when I was a kid, I checked in and checked out to a bunch of sports and then at a later time, I found something, and this is just me, I found something and I was like, I wanna play this. And whether it be, obviously we're tennis coaches and parents, but I think that's the other side of it, where as a parent, if you want them to play tennis, you may just have to relinquish that like, oh, you, I, I just want to be a good tennis player and just be a good parent and say like, yeah, let's try some other sports and see if you like it. And it, you may be playing baseball. I think there is that side of it where he's like, when you sometimes think I'm a tennis parent and how can I be good? That may mean letting your kid play other sports and seeing, you know, or other things. You know, I have had a kid who was like, hey, I, I really like playing tennis, but I really love playing guitar. Like, guitar is my jam. Yeah, go play guitar. And yeah, so it's like, you. I think you will find that ebb and flow. And yeah, kids at that really young age, they'll have fun and they'll stick with a program for a while. But then you kind of sit, and that's another conversation, the hook of like finding a good coach and finding a good structure. 
I think is another part that we're not really talking about. The environment around that kid really can propel them and assist with the fun. Because if the environment's not fun, like we've had it where kids will come and they're like, dude, I love this coach. I love being around them. I just want to show up, blah, blah, blah. They'll have bad days, but they'll still show up because of the coach and the environment and the friends. And then you've had them at some, let's say, I've worked at a country club where sometimes, you know, the kid's just there because, yeah, it's my after school thing. So the environment also sets the the, I think the tone, because I've worked at a country club and our, our tone was never to produce great, like high level players. And so the environment wasn't really set up that way. It was just like, hey, hit around. But when working at an academy, our tone was to create a place where kids would have fun, but have the opportunity to be high level. And so the environment they saw around them was like, they looked five courts over and like, dude, that dude's hitting the heck out of the ball. I want to do that. And it created this pathway where their fun and structure turned into like a, a pathway for high dev, uh, level or just being more consistent because they wanted to be around their friends. Uh, so I guess a couple of things. <laughs> um, <clears throat> first of all, I think kids are masters of knowing what's fun to them and what's not fun to them. Mm -hmm. Like they're totally in the moment. Like they're not concerned about like, if, if they're just in their own environment, in their own head, like uh, you just kind of let them be and like observe. Um, they might bounce around from thing to thing to thing. And I think for a young you know child, like certainly like a three or four, like five year old, I think that's just part of a child's like experience uh, in life and development. And so, um, I think kids always know like what's fun to them or what's not fun, but the whole goal, the whole idea of goals, I think is really tricky when you start talking about little kids, because when your whole life existence has been six years and like the biggest thing you have to worry about is like, um, having the right nightlight so that you don't get scared like at night. Like there's not a whole lot of perspective there <laughs> to think about like a college scholarship. Like what, what the heck is that? Like kid doesn't, doesn't care. And so I think that in a nutshell is kind of the biggest challenge and biggest um, danger for a parent is when they try, you talked about this a little bit uh, earlier, Kevin, when they try to be the supporter, the, the cheerleader and the pusher at the same time, the person who's like uh, trying to keep them committed and trying hard and working. And it's kind of a good cop, bad cop, like all rolled up in the same person. That's, that'll really mess with a kid, like hardcore. And I think there's a lot of parents out there that are trying to do both. Like they, yeah. of course, they love their child and they, they want their child to excel and like reach their potential and all that kind of stuff. But when a parent starts living vicariously through their kid and saying, oh, my, my child has so much more potential because they're mine. And so I know they could accomplish X, Y, Z. Trying to do both those roles at the same time is just... You said some words there. It's like a just split personality. Home. Yeah, I mean, when you said that, I mean, that's... <sighs> just just say that again. It was like my... Ch I think one of the scariest things, which is the toughest things, is a parent's love for their child when it comes to tennis. Because that love sometimes can get translated to feeling like, I know what's best for my child, yeah. when sometimes you don't. Sometimes, honestly, the kid at that young age, just like you're saying, I think with the nightlight and everything being, is like, <laughs> let them figure out. And I think the toughest thing in this, uh, the toughest thing for a parent to see is their child not succeeding or a child, when you're the parent in a social group where other kids are succeeding, your child goes, I don't want to play. And you're like, but you know, you're going to have so much fun. They're like, they're not having fun. And so I think there's, there's a really delicate balance between I think letting a kid bounce around and, and play different sports and maybe they don't find a sport, but it's like, it's their journey of figuring out, Hey, I do like this. I like that. And maybe even learning to talk to your child. And this is the toughest part without having your concerns coming out. And that's tough. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. That's tough to almost want to see your child. I kind of do want to see your child fall and let oh, them yeah. fall and get up and go, yeah. And, and then letting them go that route and giving them enough rope, but being the, the kind of like ping pong barrier of like knowing when to step in and bounce off and saying, okay, well, you know, if you don't want to do this, that's fine. We pay for this, like Megan's saying, let's finish this out and you go do something else. Yeah. 
Uh, I think that's the biggest thing, though, is that you, people when people say bounce around, yeah. I think that sometimes that for some parents, that means like, oh, well, we signed up for six weeks of soccer. Like this happens all the time in soccer from the soccer parents I've heard. And then they like two weeks in, half the team doesn't show up when they're little because they didn't want to come that Sunday afternoon or something like that. And so then they have to forfeit the soccer. And so you're not only letting down like you're letting down the team because you made a commitment to, you know, your kids sign up for a certain amount of time. So I think it's that fine balance of understanding like, okay, do yes, bounce around to different sports, play different sports. But when you do make a commitment for, I mean, a short amount of time, like a month or something like that, a month is a long time. I think that's, when you're the, a that's the key though, is like, what are exactly are, are we defining is mm. like being a quitter or because at six years old, like you're saying, uh, like a six week session or whatever is a pretty solid commitment. And I think parents should definitely should teach their kids about, you know, in life, like when you say you're going to do something, you need to follow through with it and all that kind of stuff. Like we've done that with, mm-hmm. with Lucy. Uh, it was with soccer, mm-hmm. uh, actually. There's a whole universe of difference between that and like, you're going to get a college scholarship. Right. Yeah. For it's like sure. a, yeah. a completely yeah. different thing. But I think a lot of times tennis parents apply that principle to uh, a perspective that's way bigger than what their kids could possibly have for themselves. And the parents trying to do like the right thing for their kid, but they're kind of fooling themselves into d- what their real motivation is as they, they're trying to have their kid become a certain level of success so that it reflects well on on them. And the reasoning, I think, when it's like, well, if I can push them just until they're successful, right, right. then they'll turn around and say, thank you. And that's what and scares me about you. Earlier, you were talking about the parents um, being the pusher and the kid eventually like taking to it and learning that, oh, I do enjoy this. That, that very, the, I'm, I'm like, that when that happens, yeah, it's I, like, w- at what point do you bail I, as the parent and be like, you know what? They really do like baseball more uh, and let them like go ahead and, and follow like what they're passionate about as opposed to eventually he's going to like tennis. Yeah, and, no, no, and, I and, like, totally agree. With it. That was something that I honestly never thought would work. That was like a flip of the coin. Yeah. Um, and we I had actually some, told the kid to go play another sport. All right. and I had some, <laughs> and we, I had a great relationship with the parent in the sense that I would have some very candid conversations about, you just need to chill. Like, it was constantly, you really just need to chill. Like, and in, in other words, more specific, detailed words about it. But I, I definitely agree with that. But for me, again, I think it's finding that balance. And the hardest thing, again, is where we, as a parent, reasoning out that what we're doing it's going to work out because they're going to be successful or they're going to get to this yeah. level and they're going to really enjoy it. They're going to look but, back and they'll appreciate yeah, they, it when they're older. Yeah, and I've seen so <laughs> many relationships between parent and child yeah. ruined because they kept pushing, trying to do, they became like, the, they became all three roles. It's like, I'm kind of the player because I'm going to like, I'm going to imprint my, like you, I was never that good, but I can make you that good and you'll yeah. realize how. And then there were the, the parent at home, but they never became the parent. They never came home and said, let's not talk about tennis. Let's just talk about like how school or how you feel. And, you know, and then it was just, they just tried to take the whole thing and it just blows up. Yeah. I can't tell you how many parents I kicked out of our club <laughs> because the, the number one thing that I was really huge on was if your kid is in the middle of a lesson, you are not coaching from the sideline. Like All right, you. let's shift. That was my next question. Let's go ahead and just officially kind of shift gears. Uh, what I wrote down was parent personality. Like what's <sighs> what's helpful and what's uh, what's not. That's a good place to start. So if yeah, if I was giving a lesson, um, I was very very upfront from the very beginning, and I think this is where. Um, you know, like if they're little and it was a peewee class and the parents are like coaching, I kindly, which happened all the time. No. I kindly would say, uh, hey, you know, we're going to the Pee-wee's, parents. by the way, like four years old. Yeah, it was three to five. Three, yeah. And so um, we actually made a rule for the class um, that the parents could not be out on the court and they had to watch mm. from upstairs because the problem was that they would get out there and little Jimmy, it necessarily wasn't tennis related 
kid, but they weren't paying attention. And the parent wants your kid to pay attention. And so you're like, hey, pay attention, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and you, you know, get a dozen parents right, all yelling all at their, their kids yeah. to pay attention. And then, <laughs> you know, and Jimmy's looking at mom and Lemmy's looking at dad and then he's yeah, looking at yeah. me. And, you know, it just didn't work. So you don't watch. Um, I'm going to hurt you when you get off that court. Right. But then there was also the parent that, you know, they used it as their babysitting hour. And so the kid would, did not want to play tennis whatsoever. And the parent didn't care whether the kid wanted to play tennis or ever, but oh, the kid, you know, and it was just country that. Club special. Yeah. And that was hard too. So it's probably half the juniors in a country club setting. Yeah. yeah. I think the biggest thing was, is that I was like, okay, you know, the communication, once your kid decides that tennis wants to be the route of choice for them, um, and that they want to like maybe go to the next level or they want to play tournaments at some point, you know, the, and this could be depending upon the kid could be when they're six, seven could be when they're 15 or 16. It just kind of depends upon the kid's personality, how quickly they mature, you know, uh, what the environment is, is I think huge. No. Um, and so if they, when, it, whenever, if they decide like, Hey mom, dad, I think I really want to play a tournament. Um, I remember telling my parents, like, I want to play a tournament. And both of my parents taught college tennis, so I was kind of a, a randomness of a environment at my house. Um, but my parents were really hands off. And so I, uh, my, I never forget, like, I had to play my first tournament with a metal warped racket because I had to win a tournament before my parents would buy me a racket. <laughs> now, granted, they gave me a racket before that, but that was like the thing. Our and I'm not sure. This, like, like little peewee racket in his first like adult <laughs> tournament. <laughs> I'm not sure that was the right route either. Um, but I am a huge advocate of like parents cannot coach when the coach is trying to coach. Because I had a lot of parents that would be on the sideline and they would be like, so and so, little Jimmy, pay attention. Pay attention. Do you did you hear what Coach Megan said? Did you listen to what Coach Megan said? Do you feel like you're doing what Coach Megan said? Like on the sideline, and so then I would have to be the cheerleader. And so if you truly want your coach, you believe in your coach, and you want your coach to coach the kid to the best of their abilities, you cannot also be coaching at the same time. Like or the that over cheerleader is. Yeah, or standing on the sideline and being like, great job, you made it over there. Great job, you're doing that. Great job. Like, just... Sh sh <laughs> what was that? Shut the mouth. <laughs> and, like, as hard as it is, and that's the other thing. If it really is... I used to tell parents, like, if it's really hard for you to stay quiet, truthfully, then just go upstairs behind the glass. And you can talk all you want to yourself behind the glass. But you, you have to do... You have to kind of put away your ego, put aside your beliefs on tennis, put aside all of that and just let your kid enjoy the process. And if you have good communication with the coach, I think there's a lot of coaches that felt, especially in a country club environment, that you have that, you know, the country club wants you to make money for the club. And so there's a very fine line on what you can say to the parents That's and, what I was talk about, you yeah. know, in our environment, in the Academy, like I could literally be like, sorry, you can't come back to the club ever again. Your kid's going to play tennis. Yeah, you can't do, you can't that, do no. that with a lot of, um, country club environments. And so, you know, there's that balance, but I think just saying like, Hey, I know you want what's best for your kid. I'm trying to do that. So I need you to be the cheerleader from behind the glass <laughs> is what I used to say. And then I can do my best job coaching. And Ultimately, every parent wants what's best for their kid. It's just how the coach explains it and communicates it and educates the parent to set the kid up for the best success, whether it be in tennis or any other sport that they choose to be in so that they don't end up hating tennis is the biggest thing. Whether they choose to stick with it or not is up to them. It's Oops. Go ahead. And I'll be short. In defense of parents, the, the balance is really difficult. Like, yeah. it's hel it's helpful to have the parent there and like be supportive. What, or, am I right? Like, it, it's it's helpful to have them be part of the process. Yeah. And be the cheerleader. Yes. Like that's that's really helpful for a kid, depending on the age and the personality. Of the I kid. guess when you said be there, it's like where when you're there, <laughs> how far, and are they behind the glass? Um, like I, 
grew up in a family where nobody played tennis and nobody really cared that I played tennis. <laughs> and I, it would have been nice to have some support. I was kind of all on my own. Um, so it would have been nice to have a, a presence, you know, there, uh, would have been great. But the line between like the supportive presence and like trying to take control of the process and maybe do the coach's job to even a small extent, the line is so tricky for a lot of parents, I think, because they so badly want what's best for their kid and they want the best experience. And so, uh, like you're describing, Megan, grabbing even a little bit of that coach's role starts to muddy the waters so much. And so I think that's the hardest job of the parent is to be there, be supportive, be the cheerleader, but also like keep distance on the developmental you know, side of things. Yeah, I agree with Megan. Uh, the other side of it as a parent that I think you have to watch out for is when you're, because here's the flip side. Okay, I'm going to listen to the coach. I'm going to go behind the curtain and you get behind the curtain or glass and you look around, there's other parents there. And then you have another parent. <laughs> and then what happens is these other parents are like inputting it. Like, so how many lessons are your child taking a week? Oh, and you're like, uh, I'm supposed to be taking like, like, well, my child's taking three lessons per and week. All it and, takes and, is one toxic yeah. parent. And then you go like, my child's taking three lessons a week. So, and they're going to be ranked in such and such. And like, so what are you doing? Well, you know what? I recommend, you know, that's a nice coach you have right there, but that coach this over there. This is raising my blood pressure. Uh, yeah, so. this coach over there. Oh, my God. He's like, he was number one in the nation. He's the serve specialist. And blah, blah, blah. And then he was the serve specialist and the forehand specialist. Yeah. You know, I think you should definitely, like, try to take like, a lesson from him a couple times a week. And then what I'm doing, I heard and from the other Thursdays, pro, there's a drill group. From the and... other uh, club is there's a drill group you can do over there. And then you're, you almost feel like, Oh God, I don't know anything I'm doing. And so you kind of get bombarded. And I yeah, think this yeah, is really so tough for the parents. Yeah. This is, yeah. If you don't have education, like what Megan's talking about, a coach that really knows and totally be honest on the coaching side, just so you understand a lot of coaches are one dimensional or maybe two dimensional. And I think you have to have the three dimensional coach, meaning that a lot of coaches are great coaches. But when you're talking about, and here's the other thing, the environment. I'm talking about, and this is just because I'm so tuned into developing players for high level. I'm thinking, like, oh, you need a coach who understands, has done this before, who's had experience, who understands the tournament route, who understands also when a kid needs to take a break. And that's the, the other level. The other kind of thing that you can get sucked into, which is just the environment. By whatever environment you are in, like our parents in our environment of a uh, kind of nationally ranked top academy, even if, you're, if your kid has any little athletic ability, they're going to get slowly sucked into this kind of like vortex of like seeing other and the momentum then, of yeah, everybody and else. And you start, so. you're, you're overhearing these conversations about national tournaments and kids doing this and, and you're like, am I doing the right thing? Should I be pushing harder? And so I think the toughest thing out there for you guys is finding the balance of like, where do I need to be? And I think that- Good com luck. Yeah, it is, <laughs> it is a lot of good luck. And that's why, you know, we've had parents and it's so interesting. They've had multiple kids and they go through like the hell with the first kid. Yeah, and then they're on the second kid, they're like, 10 times you know what? I'm just going to go home and, or e either way, it goes either way. It's not like yeah. guaranteed, but they've learned a lot. And so I really, and we've, We've talked like about regular this. parents and the, yeah. the first kid, like you're yeah. putting cushions around <laughs> right, everything right. and By all the, the corners kid, you're have like, them the, the, yeah, like, it's like, like whatever, yeah. they'll figure it's, it out. It's almost like I would recommend this. And I don't know if it's the best thing. It's like talk to a coach who has maybe been there for a while, who's, who could recommend a group of parents mm -hmm. you can talk to, to get some experience. Don't go out and let's like go out in the jungle and the first person you meet who's like, Assume they know I they're talking will about, tell you yeah. the magical formula. <laughs> of how to make your kid, you know, the snake in the grass, find a coach who's been there a lot and says, Hey, you know what? I really don't know a lot about this tennis coaching thing. If this is what you want to do with your child and they love it. Can you recommend a couple, not just one, a couple of parents who's done this with their child that maybe I'll go out and have lunch with, and they'll probably recommend you like some sound parents who are like, yeah, you know, this is how I approached it. And you'll, you'll see the, the spectrum of how different parents have approached this and glean from their experience because I think that's so important because if you're just trying to go out there and figure it out on your own, you are going to trip up so huge and you just don't know until you've, you, you're, you're on the ground and your kid's like crying. And Would just, maybe one caveat be to that if you yourself were a high performance like junior coach? Mm -mm. 
What do you mean? Like you're saying, if you try to just figure it out yourself, you're just going to mess everything oh, up. Oh, one, if, yeah. if you have already done the whole high-performance junior and thing. It depends on personality. Change. Times yeah. change. The other thing is like as, as going through it myself, uh, what I would recommend to myself is like I would totally, and this is the Let's next. Let's go ahead. Yeah, and okay. I, I want this to be the next uh, and probably last uh, topic. We'll, we'll probably do a part two to the tennis parenting. So let's, let's go ahead and pivot to will you or would you – coach your own kids Kevin I would <laughs> love to coach my own kid in the beginning totally in the beginning Megan is shaking her head yeah. with her hand on her face no. because <laughs> here's the thing I have no after being in the high uh, the, the high performance seeing the whole gamut I just don't want that for my son unless he really wants it. So there is no, for me, push to like, you're going to become a great tennis player because your dad knows it. Daddy was a great tennis player. There there is no (laughs) push for me. So Uh for me, it would be like just going out and complete. Like we would probably go out and try to peg each other with tennis balls and that would be fun. Like we we probably just But you don't count that as coaching, do you? Yeah, in some sense. In the beginning, it could be coaching because you're developing, and here's the other thing. From my experience, you're developing hand-eye coordination, other things that most, <laughs> most, yeah, I'm sneaky he like that. I'm sneaky like that. Sneaky. But it's like you're developing a lot of hand-eye, which could equate to a lot of other sports. Like from my background playing tennis, bo- none of my parents had any tennis playing experience. We started at the same time. I fell in love with tennis. And I started playing tennis at 13, didn't play my first tournament until I was 15. And I was just like, I want to do it. I, I'm a, a, yeah, my mom at some point, she was like trying to, she wouldn't try to coach me, but her motivation. But when I came off the court, I was ticked at myself. And she's like, you really don't have to play. Like, seriously, you can stop today. And I was I like, the same conversation and I was with my like parents. no, I will. And I was just like, ah. Yeah. And so, and, but, but that's, that's the just, parent. I don't think it, because my parents had the same I'm conversation just saying my with ex- me. My yeah. experience from it. Oh. Um, I just, I would want my kid to be motivated to play tennis. So I have no, like, it's more so just a joy out and the joy of going out and spending time with my child, doing something that we could like maybe do together and hit around. There's no like, but are you going to try to develop your child to be a good player? No, honestly, I would rather them be a good athlete and have like the skills of going out and running and jumping and be able to to deal with whatever athletically. Uh, But as far as like tennis, not really. Just because I, I know the road. And so at some point, if my child says, I want to become a really good tennis player, and I go, okay, if you really want to do this and you understand this, I will totally go find a coach. And I feel like with our experience, it would be like, okay, let's find a coach that has some history, blah, blah, blah. And I would totally be the, the, the person on the sideline just like, 100% hey. cheerleader? Yeah. I would be the, like, bring your wheels. <laughs> I love how I love how she's like this, but uh, I would not, totally be. It, Megan? No. I would totally be. Bring your wheels. We we <laughs> go have ice cream just because I've been on the other side of it. I just wouldn't want to deal with it. I would want him to come home and go, and I'd be like, "How hey, was tennis?" And he's like, "Oh, it was good." You want to talk about it or not? Okay, cool. Let's go play some uh, some Nintendo. I was going to say, like, <laughs> what's it? Let's go play Oculus Rift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's totally what we're gonna do, uh-huh. Megan. Sorry, any kids listening in the car with their parents right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, For like Kevin trying Nintendo. to be cool. Yeah, yeah. I would totally. And me want being an Oculus obviously very old. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think um, I definitely have always been like I will never teach. What's your short answer? Yeah, yes, no. no. Your short answer is now. Megan no. is hyper competitive. Yeah, I I am. I'm way too competitive to coach my good. own kid. No. <laughs> <laughs> and our son is way too stubborn, like both of us, to uh, make that combo work. So I think that um, yeah. I mean, if I think you know, before we had Lakin, I literally told Kevin, do not ever allow me to go to a competitive match of his whatsoever. Um, because like sign a notary. Yeah, like I literally was like, it would just turn out bad. But, (laughs) but now like when he like does stuff or, you know, we play tennis in the living room all the time and stuff like that. Like, I don't think I actually, and I mean, time will tell. Um, but I don't think I would be, I definitely would be the cheerleader but I don't think I would be really care as much as I thought I would about really? like the win and the, yeah, because the, but you also just turned three, right? Right. Yes. <laughs> so we'll see. But I, I honestly kind of feel more apt to be like, 
hey, I want him to really enjoy what he's doing. And that kind of overrides everything for me now that even we always had this thing, even if he's a violinist. Yes, 100%. I would totally be okay with him okay, being wow. a violinist. We I know. used to before, have this joke. Yeah. Before he was born, I literally was like, if he doesn't play a sport, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I, you know, I hated I the piano. Feeling, I played yeah. the saxophone, and I wasn't really keen on that either. And so I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Now I'm like, go for the violin, buddy. I don't know anything about it. Do whatever you want to do. I've and so. Yeah, and so my <laughs> perspective after having him was 100% different than beforehand. Oh. Huh. Wait, so it's cha- so now you're totally fine with no sports? Yeah, he Pot- could do whatever. Potential yeah, no I think it's all about like him <clears throat> loving whatever he's doing um, and understanding that when you decide that you're going to make a commitment that you stick with it for however long the commitment is. That's my biggest thing. Yeah. All right, so for me... I've made up my mind on this before I had kids. I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old now. And my st- honestly, my stance really hasn't changed. And that is, and being in the, co- I saw, the, wow, yeah, I don't want to be specific. I saw the whole parent-child thing go really bad in a lot of different environments. And so, so much so that before my wife and I even got pregnant with her, our first child, I made up my mind that I was not going to coach my kids Unless they specifically like came to me and told me that they wanted me to be on the court with them. And even then, like if I get if I get any whiff of any kind of um, negativity or anim- or like the re- friction in the relationship, I'm pulling the plug on that immediately because it's, it's just not worth the downside because I saw a tremendous strain among lifetime tennis coaches and their children. Uh, and I just don't, I don't want that for my children and I don't want it for me. Um, I totally agree with the, the tension between like wanting an athlete or not an athlete. And I'm, I'm, I don't care if they're athletic or not my kids, but if they, if neither of them played any sports at all, all the way up through adulthood, up till adulthood, I would, I would be a little disappointed. I want to go sit in the bleachers and like watch my my kids like do something. Ninja what if warrior. the bleachers is in an yeah. auditorium and they're playing the flute? <sighs> I guess that's for <laughs> something, me. Something yeah. athletic. Like I oh, did okay. music for be, yeah, over yeah, a decade, yeah. so like I love music too. But I, I want to see my kids apply themselves physically in some way. Like I would enjoy a lot. Um, my first experience watching my daughter take a tennis lesson from somebody else was incredible and I would I would love to see one of my kids find a sport that they really love and just try hard to be good at it like watching my child try to do that I think would I would enjoy it tremendously and I would work really hard to be a hundred percent cheerleader and zero coach unless they specifically came to me with a question or a problem or, or something like that yeah. that's my that's my stance I will on say it. one more thing because it seems so I think bleak for parents. In yeah, we sense. got three career <laughs> tennis coaches and we're all like, nope. nope. <laughs> it, it can be done. Uh, we had a very, very uh, yeah. high level um, player who's playing, who has a, uh, a world ranking. He plays at a, a very top 10 division one school. Um, and his dad did a phenomenal job with him. And uh, I think his little sister is probably going to be yeah. a really good player. And he was just phenomenal. And, and, and I think one of the things, at least that I took away watching from the outside, I even asked him a couple of times, like, yeah, how do you, always ask him. it was like, how do you do this? Cause he would, he was like hitting like coach hit yeah. travel, everything. He was probably one of the Once few or people twice I've seen it work can do. Well also. And, and his <laughs> kid was always what top 10 in the nation throughout every age group. And not only that, I mean, I might as well almost say his name, but I mean, the kid was probably like, what, five foot? Oh, he's like my height. He's, five, yeah, five, he's a five, tiny five, five, guy. Six. So, I mean, five, five. but um, he, I think one thing that I took away is that it was always that I felt like he, he wouldn't take his kids out unless they like literally begged him. And then it's like certain things about, okay, if we go out, you know, we're going to just have fun and. But I mean, he did put some, I mean, he was a disciplinary about it, but he was, yeah. he, he had this great mix to his credit. I mean, he's, he was a principal, you know, so I don't know if that has some things to do that he really understood probably like child development, 
I mean, he's a principal. He sees kids at all ages, but he and also he, works with teachers. Teachers, uh, on the yeah. Other side he of really rode that balance like really well. We and used I, to ask him all yeah, the time. Yeah, it's like he could probably write a course better than any of us about how to. Yeah. And I'm sure for the most part, I would imagine he was like, yeah, you might want to find someone else. Yeah, I don't know. He just he he checks all the boxes in the sense that he was a principal. He was a, a teacher himself. No. He had uh, what three kids or four? Four. Four kids. Um, he was a high level tennis player. Um, yeah, and then he got his, yeah, he got his of... kids to a extremely or one of his kids to extremely high level of playing. And I think all his kids play tennis and all of them different degrees of kind of like, but they all just kind of wanted to come out and hit with dad. And for him to kind of find that balance, it was amazing yeah. to watch. I do think that for parents out there, like you lead by example. And that was one thing that he did really well. Like during matches or whatever, he would go out and run or (laughs) he had goal. Like when you have a parent that has their own goals and your only goal is not your kids being at a certain level, that makes a huge difference. And kids just do whatever you you're doing. So if you're, if you have a routine and they see you doing certain things and they see you have certain goals, then that kind of, helps them to understand like having goals is good and it doesn't always have to be the same and you know and that kind of stuff so I don't know I think that's one of I know Kevin believes the same thing because we've had this conversation but leading by example is huge I think and so um being your own cheerleader is huge for a kid to see as well and not being like your demise as well we could really go on for ever but yeah yeah, let's cut it. Let's cut it. We have a couple questions left on the list. We'll we'll come back to this after a couple more episodes. We'll give everybody some time to <laughs> breathe, to relax we a little bit. We can do ten episodes on yeah, parent yeah. coaching. But we'd love to hear from those of you listening. If you are a parent and there's any additional questions or topics that we haven't discussed, there's a couple more that we'll we'll add to the next episode, including uh, what to look for in a coach for your kids, how do you manage the the child coach relationship, how do you switch coaches? <laughs> that's you know, that's yeah, we got plenty so, of material yeah. Uh, left, yeah. but wow. if there's other questions that you have about being a tennis parent, let us know. Hopefully, this didn't scare wasn't you. too depressing. <laughs> It's possible. Uh, hopefully it gave you some perspective and some, some tools to be able to navigate the landscape a little bit more successfully. Honestly, just talking through it, like I, it's, this is the first time I've sat, sat down, you know, with other career. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. in the break or in the lunchroom or whatever, like you talk to other coaches about like, oh man, Mrs. Jenkins is really mm-hmm. breaking me down like out there on the court or whatever. But um, this is the first time I've sat down and had like a, tried to have a, like a systematic discussion of like, you know, uh, what is good, what is bad, like what to look out for. And I think more than ever, I probably am empathizing more with parents and just realizing that's hard. Like yeah. it's very mm-hmm. difficult to navigate it well and have it be healthy for your child and healthy for your relationship uh, with your child is not easy. So but doable. It's doable. No. Kudos to all you tennis parents out there. It's not, it's not easy. Any final uh, thoughts, Kevin, Megan? Yeah, I would just say find someone who's done it before successfully and has a great relation. I think that the key to finding someone who's done it before is see if they have a great relationship with their kids afterward. And um, <sighs> if they do, you need to like grab them and sit down and have lunch and say, like, looking back, what would you do different? What was super successful? And... And, and I would add to that, does the kid enjoy being on the court? Well, yeah. And I think, yeah, when you look at, is it a successful relationship, both the parent and the child, are they still talking? Um, and did they enjoy tennis? Yeah. Like, if you look at the kid, is he like maybe a career tennis player where he's playing four or five tennis? And he enjoys, you know, you can ask. In the, and you, you can, I think, tell if you ask a parent about that, they're like, dude, that was rough. Or they're like, yeah, no, we have a great relationship. They're playing such and such. You just, you hear a sense of happiness a lot of times. And even with that, I would ask a couple people. It's still tricky. <laughs> it's still, it's still tricky. <laughs> yeah, I think it lead, lead by example. I think that's a huge, huge thing. we see, um, the parents who were very, very negative on the court themselves had uh, a lot of issues with the kids being negative on the court as well. And so, um, you know, kind of think about whether you play tennis or not leading by example is huge. Yeah. 
That's a good one. Final thing I'll say is just, I mean, from my perspective, I just feel like happiness is just so much of it. It's just not worth it. I mean, your best case scenario outcome is you get a scholarship that's worth, you know, whatever, $100,000 or whatever. You spend a lot more than that if you go down the high performance yeah. route. And so it's not worth the friction in your relationship. It's not worth your kids getting burned out and never playing tennis again uh, after high school or after college. Um, just be honest with yourself. Are, are they really enjoying it or are they doing it for you? Is I guess the last thing I would say. All right, with that, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you guys next time. See ya.